Peter Yasik visited Sudan as a staff member for the Voice of the Martyrs. He met with believers to see how he could encourage them and assist their churches. But Sudan's Islamist government put Peter in jail and falsely accused him of being in the country for other, more sinister reasons. I was charged with articles like espionage or treason or supporting the rebels with ammunition. Uh, sentence for, for espionage and treason. This was the death penalty. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help right now on the Voice of the Martyrs radio network. You know, I think we all know right now what it's like to live in a world that's been turned upside down. We all need biblical perspective to know how to trust the Lord when so many things are in turmoil around us. So it's fitting today here on Voice of the Martyrs radio that we hear from Peter Yasek. He knows what it's like to have his world turned upside down. Last week, he told us the first part of his story. He was encouraging pastors in Sudan as a part of his job as the Africa Regional Director for The Voice of the Martyrs. He was preparing to head home when he was detained at the airport in Khartoum and imprisoned. If you missed any of last week's program, you can hear it at vomradio.net. Peter also has a brand new book out sharing his story, and we will send you a free copy when you make a donation to the Voice of the Martyrs at vomradio.net. Peter was in the Czech Republic. I was home in Oklahoma as we recorded. So you may notice the sound is a little bit different than you're used to hearing when we're in our studio. When we left off, Peter was imprisoned in a cell with members of ISIS. He'd been treated badly by the other prisoners, and he was naturally discouraged. But he learned to pray for them to share the gospel with them, and his heart began to change. But since the moment I started to preach in this Al-Huda prison chapel, all mornings, uh, sadnesses, you know, and all these worries in the morning disappeared. And every morning after this first sermon in Al-Huda chapel became a joyful morning when I was able not only to pray for my family, but also to pray for my fellow prisoners, uh, you know, sitting on, on the ground, you know, around me and shivering and praying for them that the Lord also would speak to their hearts, even or invite, would uh, drag them to the, the, the chapel so that they could hear the gospel there. Peter, you, you had really an amazing spiritual experience in prison. You've talked about that a little bit today. I've, I've talked with other former Christian prisoners who have said, I miss being in prison. I, I miss that special closeness with God. How have, you, how have you tried to keep that spirit going and keep that closeness now that you're back home with your family, you're back to sort of your normal life, how have you tried to keep some of those patterns or, or keep that closeness with the Lord? Yeah, when I started travel uh, and I was very busy, in fact, last year I uh, probably made 165,000 miles flying around the world. Wow. Uh, I did not have that much time, you know, to spend in my closet uh, with my Bible and uh, reading. So I was trying to use any time while sitting in the airplane, you know, and reading the electronic Bible. Uh, uh, later on, you know, uh, I uh, downloaded the audio Bible. So I was still, I was trying to get exposed to the Word of God in a similar way uh, through the, uh, listening to the audio Bible uh, whilst uh, being on the long flights. I'm trying to use a, a, every opportunity to get exposed to the Word of God. And of course, you know, the situation that we have now in many countries uh, when we are uh, locked down with this uh, quarantine, all of us, we have more time, of course, to spend it with our families. And that's, that's beautiful that we have that time as Christians. But I would like to encourage people to spend even more time with 
their Lord and his word. Uh, in one sense, it reminds me the situation that I was uh, in when I was in the solitary confinement. You know, I could not do activities that I would normally be doing. But now, uh, in the similar situation, there are many activities that I would like to do and I can't uh, do them. But I have a choice, you know, how I want to use my time. Of course, I can use it to read the word of God, pray, or listen to the audio Bible, or I can get distracted easily by paying attention uh, to the more or less uh, the same news and frightening news about uh, uh, the disease that is spreading around, uh, uh, or browsing internet, or, or uh, watching television. There is a slight difference that I have the choice now uh, what I want to do in my time. And I would like to encourage uh, the listeners of uh, VOM Radio to really spend more time with our Lord and His Word, pray in our, in our closet, and uh, let Him to prune our lives, you know, as we read in John 15, so that we could be prepared to better serve to our persecuted uh, brothers and sisters, uh, to be better tools for his kingdom. Because, you know, if we, we uh, will abide in Christ, we can certainly bring better fruit. And, you know, what is the best fruit that we as Christians can bring in this world? You know, this is obvious that we as Christians should multiply ourselves by making disciples. And that's uh, the things that if we will abide in Christ, which means to abide in his word, abide in his church, in his body, and abide in the intimate relationship with our Lord, then we don't need to be worried about the uh, future. We don't need to be uh, worried about uh, the bad news that uh, are being uh, around us. Uh, and we don't need to be afraid even about persecution that is increasing also in our Western world, because we know that we are in our Lord and he will never allow us to go through anything that he would not uh, prepare us for. Amen. Am I remembering correctly, when you finally got a Bible, you read through the entire thing, was it three weeks? Yes, my first reading after five months of not having this uh, opportunity to hold the Bible in my hands, I read standing at the window that was, uh, you know, leaning on the bars in the window. And I read the Bible from 8 a.m. till uh, maybe 5 p.m. every day. And I finished reading from Genesis to Revelation within three weeks. We're talking today on Voices of Martyrs Radio with Peter Yasik. He is the author of a brand new book, Imprisoned with ISIS, Faith in the Face of Evil. Again, if you come to vomradio.net, we have a special way you can get a free copy of the book when you make a donation to the Voice of the Martyrs, vomradio.net. Peter, the, the dictator, Omar al-Bashir, his government is the one that put you in prison and kept you there for 444 days. His government was overthrown last year, and he actually ended up in one of the same prisons where you had been held. When, when that happened, and when you saw the overthrow of the government, when you saw him being arrested and, and put in prison, what were your feelings as you were seeing this happen, again, in, in one case, in the same jail where you had been held? Yeah, yeah. You know, I uh, have been in touch uh, with my Sudanese brothers uh, and fellow prisoners uh, uh, since I was released. And I had fresh information from uh, the country of Sudan. And I uh, have to correct, you know, this enthusiasm uh, or maybe put it a little bit down because the guy who let the coup against uh, Pre President uh, Umar Bashir, he was actually his cousin who is married to Bashir's daughter. Uh, how can you expect that the cousin uh, who is married to a daughter of this dictator would uh, uh, initiate or uh, start uh, uh, dramatic changes in the country? Uh, and then uh, the power was handed over to the transitionary uh, military council that was led by Mr. Hameti, who is uh, you know, uh, known uh, being as a also wanted criminal by International Criminal Court. And the major thing is that in one sense, the situation has not changed, especially not for our dear brothers and sisters in Sudan. 
Why? Because it is not the government, uh, it is not the ministers who are at power. It's still the secret police who is actually governing uh, the country of Sudan. By the way, you know, the, the leader of the secret police who built the prison called as the National Intelligence and Security Service prison, uh, the first prison that I was put in, he uh, later on was dismissed, accused of uh, a coup, and he spent six months in this prison. His name is Salah Abdullah Ghosh. And then Mr. Muhammad Atta was the leader of the secret police. Uh, even shortly before Pre uh, President Bashir was uh, overthrown. Again, you know, Salah Abdullah Ghosh was uh, reinstated into his position and uh, Muhammad Atta was removed. So, you know, there are some changes uh, that uh, uh, were seen at that time already. But what clearly we can see now is that uh, the secret police is still ruling the country. And whenever my uh, Sudanese brothers call me or contact me through secure ways and uh, they get a little bit more excited uh, about uh, some changes. I asked them, how is it? Can you now go and can you preach the gospel to the uh, majority people in your country, to Muslims, uh, freely? And they said, no, it's still illegal. Or uh, I said, what if a Muslim background believer openly declares his new faith? What will happen? There is still a death penalty for that. The democratic forces tried to remove the aspect of Islam from their country, uh, which was not accepted. So the the Christians in Sudan still face uh, similar problems in Sudan, even though with the Western optics and with the biased Western media, uh, sometimes we might ha get the false impression that the country is free and uh, that uh, they can freely go and preach the gospel to Muslims. I'm glad you updated us on that because that was one of my questions. Is is it different for Christians now? It sounds like not a lot has changed in terms of Christians and especially, as you say, Muslim converts. Nothing is different for them. Yeah, the Western media, including BBC, for instance, last Christmas, they were informing that the Minister of Religious Affairs went to some of the Christian churches in Khartoum. And he publicly, before the media, apologized for the persecution that the Christians experienced, right? Many people were phoning me, you know, writing me, emailing, texting me, you know, ex getting excited about that. And I told them my experience that we have experienced with uh, two pastors and Brother Munim on uh, December 26, 2016. You know, we had the court hearing on the, as we say, the second Christmas day in our country, when uh, these uh, interrogator and uh, prosecutors show up, they were shaking our hands, smiling at us and telling us, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, uh, knowing that uh, what will follow in the courtroom. It was actually on the same day, Pastor Hassan's wife was approached by the general of the secret police, who was the main uh, initiator of all this court case. And he was assur uh, assuring uh, Hassan's wife that her husband will be released before the end of the year, knowing that he will be sentenced to 12 years in prison. So when people hear, you know, these tactics of the secret police that we have experienced, they can easily understand that uh, the open statement of the Minister of uh, Religious Affairs in Sudan doesn't mean actually uh, anything. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Peter Yasik. He's the author of a brand new book, Imprisoned with ISIS, about his 444 days imprisoned in Sudan. Peter, when people finish the book, when they read your story and they come to the end of the book, what do you want them to walk away with or, or what do you want to leave them with? You know, at the end of the book, I put uh, a kind of a few thoughts about the meaning of persecution, which uh, in one sense uh, means that, uh, you know, this is mainly intended for Christians and how they should view the persecution, how they should uh, think about that when they will potentially experience the persecution on their own. I would say that uh, my main intention was to show the great 
sovereign Lord that we serve, and that uh, if we commit our lives into his hands, that they, they do not need to worry about anything, and they can trust the Lord that uh, he will lead them through the valley of death that we went through and he will uh, support them. But uh, I also uh, want to emphasize the passage that we read in Romans 8. Paul says that um, we are as sheep uh, that are supposed to be slaughtered as Christians. And he said daily we are given as sheep to be slaughtered. And Paul says that, but in all of that, we are more than conquerors. I hope that my book will not give the impression to people that uh, we will be delivered and rescued from all forms of persecution because the Lord Jesus uh, prepared his followers by saying that some of you will be killed. But I hope that at least it will increase the trust of uh, the readers in our Lord that he is a sovereign Lord and he will be with us uh, in any moment of our lives uh, once we have committed uh, our lives into his hands. And my desire uh, and my wish is that uh, no matter what will happen in our lives and in the reader's lives, that they will get determined, that uh, they will never, never, never deny uh, the Lord in spite of difficult situation that can go beyond our imagination. And again, you can get a copy of Peter's book, Imprisoned with Isis, when you come to vomradio.net and make a donation to the Voice of the Martyrs. We will send you a copy of the book. Peter, as you know, when we finish up every episode of Voice of the Martyrs Radio, we try to equip people to pray. And so I want to ask you uh, two prayer questions. First, for Christian prisoners, and you mentioned Pastor Haile in Eritrea. I, I think of him often. How do we pray for the Christians who are currently in prison, but also for their families? Because you know your family went through a lot during your time in prison. So how do we pray for Christians in prison right now, and how do we pray for their families? Absolutely. I will start, how do we pray for their families? Uh, I think that we should pray that the Lord will just allow them to experience the supernatural uh, heavenly peace that uh, uh, is surpassing all human understanding, uh, that they would not worry about their beloved ones, that their faith will be strengthened through the time when they are separated from their beloved uh, uh, ones. When I think about those who are in prison, based on my my own experience, I would encourage the listeners of VOM Radio to uh, pray that the Lord will give them opportunities to be the ambassadors of the gospel in chains, uh, which is what Paul says in uh, Timothy, and that uh, they will be the city set on a hill, that they will have opportunities not only to share the gospel among the fellow prisoners, but they will be also able to preach the gospel to their persecutors, to the guards, to the interrogators, and that uh, those people could also hear the gospel and that uh, their lives could be transformed through the encounter with our Lord Jesus Christ. And you experienced firsthand the power of people's prayers. And I know you talk about this in the book. Tell tell me the story of you going to bed at night because I, you know, sometimes people will ask me, well, does it really make a difference when we pray? Does it really matter when we pray? I, I think your story is one that illustrates, boy, it absolutely makes a difference. Talk about the prayers of your church family and how that helped you in prison in Sudan. I have noticed that when uh, I was in the first prison among the six members of uh, ISIS, and I you know I was uh, at the merge, I was worried about my mental health because I was uh, witnessing not only five times per day prayers, they were reading Korans throughout the whole day, or they were eating or sleeping. Uh, I could never sleep at the, at, uh, during the day. And when the evening uh, came and uh, they finished their last prayers of that day, you know, the nightlife started in our cell. And uh, I was uh, not really knowing from which side they will hit me, kick me, or slap my face, or kick my back with their legs. I was, you know, surprisingly, you know, amidst of this noisy cell, when 9 p.m. came, 
I experienced something uh, tremendous and uh, amazing that I was always wondering because uh, really not knowing from which side they will hit me and imagine that I was also uh, malnutrished and I was heavily anemic. When 9 p.m. came, I could lay down and I fell asleep and I could sleep throughout the night till maybe 4 a.m. But this was an amazing thing. I got the answer a few months later. When I started to receive letters from my family, I found out why exactly and at 9 p.m. I could fall asleep. You know, my home church, when I got arrested and uh, my family informed our church and friends, in our church we have a prayer application that uh, people have on their phones and at 8 p.m. our time, they decided that everyone will pray uh, for one hour in the place where people were. They were not come together, but they laid down their work or leisure and they started to pray for one hour. And so people were literally on their knees praying for me from 8 p.m. till 9 p.m. But the most important thing is that the time difference in winter time between Czech Republic and Sudan was one hour. So actually from 9 p.m. Sudanese time till 10 p.m., many people were fervently praying for me. And I could physically feel it by falling asleep peacefully and sleeping throughout the night amidst of my enemies. When I realized that, you know, I was also convicted by the Holy Spirit in my personal life. How many times people ask me to pray for them? And I said, yes, yes, I will keep you in my prayers. And I was convicted that this just became a social Christian phrase in my life. And I decided that when I will be released, not only that I will be praying for Christians, especially for those who are persecuted, uh, but also I will encourage the Christians living in the free countries to fervently pray for our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. Of course, you know, we serve the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God who could help them without us. But he doesn't want to do it without us. He wants, he's the Lord of fellowship. He wants to hear from us and answer our prayers. He wants to see the body, his body functioning, his church functioning and being alive. How do we pray for the people of Sudan? And especially, how do we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters there? Yeah, I would like to encourage uh, the listeners to pray for brothers and sisters in Sudan that the Lord would uh, give them courage to do the uh, main task that we as Christians uh, are supposed to do, to make disciples of all people, to share the gospel, uh, not to be afraid of uh, the people that often would intimidate them by saying you can't preach the gospel to Muslims, it's not allowed, that the Lord would give them the courage to follow him fully and to uh, make disciples even of Muslims by sharing the gospel with them, that the Lord would uh, allow especially the leaders of the churches to encourage their church members to do so and uh, not to be afraid of any potential consequences of that, but just uh, trusting the Lord that he will give them the right words in the right moment, even if they will be interrogated, arrested, or imprisoned. Thank you so much, Peter, for sharing with us this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. I want to encourage people, read Peter's book. It is outstanding. You will be blessed. Your faith will be challenged. And again, when you make a donation to Voice of the Martyrs at vomradio.net, we'll send you a copy for nothing. So uh, you can make a donation, receive a copy of the book, and I would encourage you to read it. Peter, thank you so much for your time, and I hope we get to be back in the studio together again sometime soon, uh, but it sure has been great to talk to you this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you for your invitation, and I also hope to see you face-to-face -face, uh, in the future and, and to meet uh, many believers in the United States uh, across your whole nation who are praying for me when I needed uh, their prayers. You've been listening to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. As always, if you're just joining us, you can go online, vomradio.net. 
to hear this entire conversation. There's also a link there where you can make a donation to receive a free copy of Peter's book, vomradio.net. We are going to be back next week as we continue to talk about what God is doing around the world, about our persecuted family members, what they are going through, how God is working, and how we can pray for them right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.